Okay, uh, today's lecture let us continue our discussion of path integrals of a single quantum particle. So, basically if you recall uh, in the last class I explained how to study the path integral approach to finding the propagator that means the probability amplitude of finding a particle at uh, uh, xf at tf at time tf when the po position of the particle was xi at time ti. So, that is called the uh, propagator and uh, that probability amplitude is basically given by a path integral and uh, the path integral uh, what we mean by that is you first uh, uh, introduce a function uh, called the weight which is uh, e basically e raised to it is uh, e raised to i by h bar times s where s is the action between uh, t i and t f that means the if you remember ac action is the time integral of the Lagrangian from the initial time to the final time. So, this is the weight and uh, this propagator that means the amplitude for finding the particle at x f at time t f if the particle was initially at x i at time t i is given by this, uh, this integral over all possible paths connecting uh, these two points that is connecting x i at t i and x f at t f. So, that means that uh, the starting and ending points are the same for all the paths, but uh, the paths themselves are different and you have to add up all the possible paths with uh, this as the weight. So, uh, before I uh, proceed with this example of harmonic oscillator, I have to make some general remarks and that is you see this, uh, this approach to quantum mechanics that is this path integral approach to quantum mechanics is uh, very in, uh, conducive to understand why uh, in what way exactly does uh, quantum mechanics lead to classical mechanics as a kind of limiting case. See in the case of uh, Schrodinger's approach to quantum mechanics it seems very abrupt and uh, it is hard to imagine why uh, how you can uh, reproduce uh, classical mechanics from quantum mechanics. See the reason is because you see after all uh, what is Schrodinger equation? It is, uh, it is basically the uh, time evolution of the wave function of the system. But whereas uh, the classical equations of motion are refer to the trajectory of the particle that is f equal to ma. So, a is uh, d squared x by dt squared. So, there is, seems to be a complete, um, uh, there is no similarity between these two approaches at all. See on the one hand this is a time dependent Schrodinger equation mathematically also it is a first order equation in time derivative that means i h bar d by d t of psi whereas Newton's second law is a second order uh, time derivative that is m d squared by d t squared x equals uh, force. So, there seems to be no relation between the two. So, uh, it is, uh, but it is possible to uh, finally come make peace with the, these two approaches that you can actually show that by doing a certain set of transformations. Uh, in fact, uh, the Hamilton Jacobi theory of classical mechanics is ideally suited to understand how Schrodinger's quantum mechanics is linked to classical mechanics. But uh, the even better approach to see the connection between the two is actually this path integral. So, rather than uh, do a quantum mechanics using Schrodinger's wave function, what you uh, can do uh, is that you might as well study quantum mechanics in from a path integral perspective and then you will be easy, uh, you will be uh, able to see easily the connection between classical and uh, quantum mechanics and how is that. So, in fact, I should have spent some time explaining that properly, but I am going to explain it verbally uh, in the hope you will understand. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, you see this kind of a probability amplitude uh, will uh, see suppose the system was classical, right. If the system was classical, what do you expect the answer to this probability amplitude to be? So, what is the meaning of this probability amplitude? The probability amplitude says that what is the probability amplitude for the particle to be found at x f at time t f if the uh, 
particle was initially at x i at t i. So, but if the particle obeyed classical mechanics, the, of course, there is no such concept of probability in classical mechanics. But suppose you want to forcibly answer that question, that suppose you want to forcibly bring yourself to answer this question, what is the probability amplitude for finding the particle at x f at t f if it starts off at x i at t i? assuming the particle strictly obeys classical equations of motion, that means it obeys classical mechanics. Then the answer clearly is uh, the probability amplitude is 0 unless uh, XFTF is the solution, uh, basically unless XFTF falls on the trajectory of the particle, right. So, unless XFTF is obtained by solving F equal to MA. Right. So, uh, so unless you can uh, show that the answer is 0. So, so, in other words the probability is 0 until and unless XFTF falls on the trajectory. So, that would be the answer if the particle obeyed classical mechanics. So, now let us try to see in what way the right hand side also leads to the same conclusion. So, so what path integral tells us that XI, TI, XFTF this uh, probability amplitude is given by this path integral of e raised to i by h bar s, where s is the action between T i and T f. So, if it is purely classical, this is uh, clearly equal to 0 unless x f T f falls along the uh, trajectory of the particle. So, the question is can we come to the same conclusion by taking the classical limit of the right hand side. So, the classical limit, so this is a purely quantum mechanical statement. So, I am taking classical limits on both sides. So, the classical limit of the left hand side basically says that, uh, so if I take the classical limit of the left hand side the answer is 0 unless XFTF falls on the trajectory. So, what is it on the right hand side? Can we come to the con same conclusion? So, but to that for that reason I have to make sure that I take the classical limit of the right hand side. So, how do you take classical limit? So, you see uh, you know that it is Planck's constant which determines whether uh, quantum mechanics is uh, operative uh, is, is being obeyed or uh, classical mechanics. So, so, if Planck's constant is not 0 that means quantum mechanics is being obeyed. So, if you make plan constant 10 to 0, so imagine like mathematically uh, you have this control over Planck's constant. So, you make Planck's constant tends to 0, then what you are doing is you are making the world more and more classical. So, you are making it less and less quantum mechanical. So, it is the Planck's constant that determines how, how quantum mechanical the world is. So, if you make it really 10 to 0 then the world will become more and more classical and when it becomes 0, it it's becomes fully classical. So, the question is uh, suppose you take that sort of limit, you pretend that h bar is a variable and you see it is a constant in the sense that it is right now uh, in our universe it is a constant fixed by nature. But in, in our minds we can always think of it as a variable and try to see what happens if you change it to some other value. So, that mental activity exercise we can do uh, ourselves. So, if you make h bar tends to 0, see what uh, what happens is that basically this, this, uh, this is an oscillatory term. So, you have h bar in the denominator. So, you will get a e raised to i times s by h bar, but s by h bar tends uh, becomes very large because h bar tends to 0. So, when h bar tends to 0 and that s by h bar becomes very large, you will get a, a, a complex number of unit modulus, but whose uh, phase keeps oscillating wildly. That means, it it changes. Uh, so, basically this is if you write it in the complex plane, uh, uh, sorry not the 3 dimensional, it is just 2 dimensional complex plane. So, uh, so this, so your e raised to i theta will be like this. So, if theta changes slowly, then this complex number will slowly go around the circle or the unit circle. But if theta changes very fast, then it will it will rapidly uh, make many uh, rounds of the circle. So, that on an average, so you see you are integrating over all paths and so the, the point is that since h bar is tending to 0, the claim is that over every path 
the uh, so that means this this thing will average out to zero because it's kind of uh, rapidly becoming uh, you know it is traversing over all points on the unit circle a lot of it will cancel out so the most dominant contribution to this uh, integral will be when this action tries to uh, mitigate or uh, try to tries to nullify the effect of this vanishing planck's constant see this vanishing planck's constant threatens to make this whole integral become zero because the phases rapidly cancel out see uh, if s is uh, fixed and h bar tends to zero so there is a, a tendency for uh, you know lots of cancellations to happen because this uh, phase is so large there is a rapid cancellation between so even if you change the path slightly the phase changes by a huge amount because of the h bar in the denominator which tends to zero so as a result there is a lot of cancellation so the most dominant contribution to that integral therefore comes when the action does something to minimize the effect of this vanishing planck's constant so what it does is that s tends to become as small as possible so if you reach a situation where you find the s becomes minimum that is the situation in which uh, this integral will be dominant that means all all paths which make s different from its minimum value will contribute significantly less compared to the path which makes s the minimum value in the situation where planck's constant is tending to zero so i hope that is clear it's very hard for me to put this in words so the bottom line is that when planck's constant tends to zero the action has to mitigate mitigate means nullify so it has to nullify the effect of the smallness of the planck's constant so that's going to happen if uh, the planck's constant i mean if uh, the action itself becomes zero but usually that's not the case so the next best thing is for the action to be as minimum as possible so minimum is close to zero so so it will try to become as close to zero as possible so if you successfully find the path which makes the action uh, the minimum value then that path is the one that contributes significantly and all other paths contribute significantly less uh, so much so that you can uh, as well ignore them so as h bar tends to zero you can ignore all paths except the path which makes the action a minimum and you know very well that the path that makes action the minimum is precisely the path that obeys lagrange equations or in other words newton's second law which is the same thing so bottom line is that we are now successfully proved that the left hand side says it is the amplitude for finding the particle at x f at time t f is Uh, if it starts off at x i at time t i is zero unless x f t f falls on the trajectory so that's what the left hand side says but the right hand side also says the same thing because then the right hand side says that as h bar tends to zero the only path that contributes to this path integral is the path which minimizes the action so in other words it's the path that obeys lagrange equations or in other words it's the path that obeys newton's second law so in other words finally it's the path that falls on the trajectory of the particle so you can see that both the left hand side and the right hand side say the same things in the classical limit so after this long winded uh, confirmation that you are able to successfully recover classical expectations from a quantum mechanical path integral so let us proceed to actually solve the quantum harmonic oscillator without referring to any classical limits okay so i hope that is clear so uh, i just wanted to impress upon you that the path integral approach is very nice in visualizing how quantum mechanics becomes classical mechanics in in some sense in certain limits so so that's a very elegant way of visualizing how to uh, recover classical mechanics from quantum mechanics which can be very uh, uh, daunting and very difficult to see uh, how that would come about if you started with say the time dependent schrodinger equation because everything seems very different there okay so now let's get back to 
purely quantum mechanics. So, in purely quantum mechanics I want to answer this question what is the propagator, what is the probability of uh, a mass tied to a spring which is initially found at x i that means the displacement from its equilibrium position of the mass from its equilibrium position is x i at the at initial time t i. So, the question is what is the probability amplitude for finding that mass uh, to be displaced by a amount x f at time t f right. So, x i if x i is 0 that means the spring is not stretched at the initial time if x i is some value called x i that means the spring has been stretched by an amount x i at time t i. So, we will start with the general case that at time t i the spring is stretched by an amount x i. So, now the question is what is the amplitude that the spring is stretched by an amount x f at time t f. So, the answer is this path integral. So, uh, it's basically the integral of the Lagrangian which is the action and what is the Lagrangian is the kinetic energy minus half k x squared which is the potential energy. So, the rest of it is just straightforward uh, you know algebraic manipulation which we have encountered earlier when we were discussing the path integral of a free particle. So, remember what we did there, what we did was we looked at the uh, classical, uh, so that means we found the path that minimizes the action and we wrote any general path as the path that minimizes the action plus some corrections. So, that means some deviations. So, we wrote the actual path x as the classical path. So, the classical path is the path that minimizes the action plus some, uh, some deviations around the classical path. So, so, classical path is a fixed path because uh, there is a unique path that connects x i at t i and x f at t f. So, that is fixed. So, if you are integrating over all paths like you are supposed to do in this 7.67 uh, equation. So, integrating over all paths x is same as integrating over all deviations x tilde. So, in other words this. So, that is what we are going to do, we are going to write x as x classical plus x tilde which is the deviation. Uh, because uh, x and x classical both obey the same initial condition that means at t i x classical is x i therefore, and x, uh, x itself is also x i at t i. So, it uh, follows immediately that uh, uh, x tilde the deviation should be 0 at uh, the initial and final times because all paths start and end at the same time right. So, there is no deviation at the initial and final time it is only they deviate in between. So, because they do not deviate at the end points it immediately implies that there is you uh, there is periodicity in the, the so the deviations are basically periodic function of time because they start and end at the same point which is 0. So, so therefore, you can immediately rewrite the deviation in terms of a discrete Fourier series because it is periodic and moreover that discrete Fourier series will only involve the trigonometric sine function rather than the cosine function because it has to vanish at the end points ok. Uh, so, now the rest is cosmetic. Uh, so, what we are going to do is we are going to write uh, uh, the time uh, variable in terms of a dimensionless parameter. So, so we rewrite time in this way so that s equal to 0 corresponds to the initial time t i and s equals 1 corresponds to the final time t f. So, basically uh, I have rescaled the time so that the initial time corresponds to some dimensionless uh, parameter that keeps track of time evolution which is called s. So, I start off with time t i which corresponds to the dimensionless parameter s being 0 and I end at time t f which corresponds to the dimensionless parameter s being 1. So, now uh, I simply go ahead and substitute all this into my action which is in 7.67 exponent and then I am going to skip all the algebraic steps because they are kind of straightforward but tedious, uh, but you can just go ahead and do that. So, it is it is simply going to be this ok. So, uh, 
it is going to be this. So, the answer clearly is going to be the classical paths plus some path integral over the deviation. Okay. So, now the classical paths uh, are um, okay. So, we will have to evaluate the uh, yeah. So, the, I have evaluated the classical action. So, I have used the classical path. What is the classical path? So, the classical path connecting x i at t i and x f at t f for the harmonic oscillator. Keep in mind that we are not doing a free particle, we are doing a mass tied to a spring. So, which is why there is an omega there and remember what m omega is, it is square root of k by m where k is the spring constant. So, this is mass tied to a spring. So, what this says is that the classical path that means x c l bracket t what does this mean? It is the displacement the, the amount by which the spring stretches at time t right. If, if it has stretched by an amount x i at time t i and it has stretched by an amount x f at time t f by how much would it stretch at some general time t if the part if the mass tied to the spring obeyed classical mechanics. So, the answer to that question is 7.68. So, 7.68 tells you the amount by which the spring ha would have stretched if the mass tied to it obeyed classical mechanics and if the spring had stretched by an amount x i at time t i and also it is uh, we know that it had stretched by an amount x f at time t f. So, the general at some general time it would be stretched by this amount. Okay. So, clearly in, in quantum mechanics you cannot say exactly by how much it would have stretched, there will be a probability for it to have stretched by a certain amount or probability density. So, uh, but classically you can say this is exactly by how much it would have stretched at time t. So, that is why it is classical subscript classical. So, the answer to the quantum mechanical question is uh, in the path integral approach is so the quantum mechanical question is the left hand side. So, it, the quantum mechanical question asks what is the probability amplitude for the particle or for the spring to have stretched by an amount x f at time t f if we know for a fact that it had stretched by an amount x i at time t i. So, that is a completely quantum mechanical uh, question and a valid quantum mechanical question to ask. So, the answer to that question is uh, given by this, it is e raised to i by h bar times the classical action which is evaluated this way by just substituting the classical path times some quantity which I have called g t f minus t i is obtained by integrating over all deviations from the classical path. But just like in uh, the case of free particle, it is really not necessary to evaluate this explicitly because you could in fact, this is not at all difficult to evaluate, but finally you will end up having to do some unnecessarily complicated looking product over integers. Rather it is easier to adopt this approach we have adopted for the a free particle namely what we do is that just like in the free particle that if t f tends to t i that means if the question you are asking is what is the uh, so so the left hand side is still that that means if the spring was stretched by an amount x i at t i what is the uh, amplitude that is stretched by x f at t f is the original question. But now imagine that uh, T f tends to T i that means you do not give it enough time for it to stre stretch by some other amount that means it is it was stretched by an amount x i at time T i, but now T f tends to T i that means. So, now the question is by what do you expect the amount by which the spring will be stretched at T f. The answer is clearly uh, uh, 0 unless uh, x f is equal to x i is not it because you are not giving it enough time to stretch by a different amount because it, you see t f the final time is more or less the same as the initial time. 
So, whether it is quantum mechanical or classical you are not giving it enough time to stretch by a different amount. So, the answer is 0 unless, uh, so if T f tends to T i the answer to the left hand side namely this one is 0 unless x f it is e itself is equal to x i. So, that is basically the delta function ok. So, that is the delta function and because that is the delta function. Uh, so, what we have to do is rather than evaluate this uh, awkward integral over all deviations, we simply uh, utilize this, this idea and say that look uh, when T f tends to T i, uh, I am just going to evaluate this as T f tends to T i and only retain the dominant terms. So, the dominant terms clearly are this. And just like in this case now you get this result and then if you really want to know what this looks like you integrate over all x i or whatever and uh, this will give you some, uh, some function of T f minus T i and this will be 1. So, this we did earlier by the way it is not new we did this for the free particle is pretty much the same in fact it is identical because. Uh, when T f tends to T i it does not matter whether it is a mass tied to a spring or a free particle the omega dependence simply drops out. See the omega dependence it determines whether it is a mass tied to a spring or a free particle. So, if it is omega is 0 that means there is no spring. Remember what omega is, omega is square root of k by m. So, if omega is 0 that means there is k is 0, if k is 0 there is no spring if there is no spring it is a free particle. So, but in this case when T f tends to T i the even if omega was initially there it simply drops out of the classical action. So, in that limit uh, in T f tends to T i it, it does not matter whether it is a spring or a free particle it gives you the same answer. So, bottom line is the same answer is this, this is what we got for the free particle this is now what we are getting this g is the same whether it is free particle or mass tied to a spring. But however, of course, the rest I mean the final answer is different depending upon whether it is a, a free particle or a spring because the classical action the general classical action clearly depends on omega. So, if there is omega in the answer that means uh, you are referring to a mass tied to a spring rather than a free particle. So, this is the answer to the original important question that we asked. So, namely so, 7.79 is the answer to the question what is the probability amplitude for a uh, mass tied to a spring. Uh, so, in other words what is the probability amplitude for a spring to be stretched by an amount x uh, x f if it at time t f if it was initially stretched by an amount x i at time t i t i if that spring was tied to a mass obeying quantum mechanics. So, that answer to that rather long wordy question is this 7.79 and see that we obtained this answer using path integrals. Uh, whereas, we could of course, have obtained this using Schrodinger equation also and how would we have obtained this using Schrodinger equation in fact that is worth knowing. So, what we would do is that we would uh, uh, write the uh, probability amplitude for so the initial so we would write the wave function like this right. So, the, the initial wave function would be like this. So, then we would solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation with this initial condition. Uh, right. Uh, so, we would uh, solve this like this psi. So, we would solve uh, this equation this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation with this initial condition you would get uh, x at uh, so you will get this then uh, so from by solving this you will get this because you know the initial condition. Because you got this then you can substitute x f here and t f here and whatever you get is this answer. This is the probability amplitude for finding the particle at x f t f it was initially at uh, x i at t i.
So, here we know that it is really at x i at t i. So, that is why it is a delta function to begin with ok. Anyway, so this is the answer uh, and this is how would you would do it. Maybe we will give this as an assignment in one of the tutorial classes ok. Uh, so, the next section uh, refers to you know what would how would you rewrite path integrals if so, uh, if there were two particles instead of one. So, remember that till now we have studied the path integral uh, approach to quantum mechanical questions when there is exactly one quantum particle in your system. Whether it is free particle we had one, one calculation we did and for a harmonic oscillator there was one mass tied to one spring. But now you could also have a situation where there are two quantum particles. But then, if there are two quantum particles, things are actually slightly more complicated because you know the uh, in nature there are things called fermions and bosons. So the overall wave function of the two particles have to be symmetric under the exchange or anti-symmetric under the exchange. So. So, you cannot see even if uh, the particles, the two particles that you have in, uh, in front of you, they do not directly interact with each other through any force or anything, they will still sense each other's presence simply because of quantum mechanics. See, in quantum mechanics, every particle is either a fermion or a boson. So, if it is a fermion, they have to uh, anti-symmetrize their wave function with respect to the other one. So, in other words, the overall wave function of all the fermions put together has to be anti-symmetric under the exchange of the positions of each, uh, any two fermions. So, that implicitly means, indirectly means that each fermion senses the presence of the others even if there are no forces which compel them to uh, feel each other's presence. Normally, a particle feels some other particle's presence uh, either because say both are charged particles and they experience uh, an electromagnetic force between each other or if they are massive objects, they could feel gravitational forces and so on and so forth. But uh, even if you consider a very hypothetical ideal situation where they feel absolutely no forces between each other, quantum mechanics, uh, the mere fact that these, these particles obey quantum mechanics means that you cannot escape or these particles cannot escape uh, from feeling force forces between each other. So, uh, so the bottom line is that they sense each other. So, they do not they don't necessarily feel a force in the sense in which uh, you would feel forces if you were charged or something, but they certainly sense each other's presence by virtue of the fact that the overall wave function has to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So, bottom line is that when you are doing quantum mechanics of more than one particle, you have to be conscious of this uh, very important fact that you have to either symmetrize the wave functions or anti-symmetrize them uh, depending upon whether they are bosons or fermions respectively. So, the same applies when you are trying to study uh, the properties of more than one particle using path integrals which is the subject of the present uh, chapter or present lecture. So, that is going to be a little hard and uh, and I have made some effort in this section 7.4 to address this issue in my book. But however, because it is a little tricky and uh, it is hard to explain these things in words, as it is I am having trouble explaining things in words uh, in the uh, earlier sections as well. Because most of the, uh, you know, most of theoretical physics is written in the language of mathematics and mathematics is not easily translatable into colloquial languages like English or Hindi. Mathematics is its own language. So, you have to understand how to speak mathematics and uh, so that is why it is uh, theoretical physics is best taught, it is best self taught. Uh, 
it's not easy to teach it in a classroom because in a classroom you have to use words and words are necessarily in some language other than mathematics. Anyway, bottom line is that you'll have to read 7.4 on your own in order to understand how to uh, study the path integral of more than one quantum particle. So I'm going to skip this entirely, but you should be studying it because I have explained how to do it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to quickly introduce the next chapter and then I'm going to stop. So in the next chapter, what we are going to do is we are going to ramp up our understanding of uh, novel ways of doing quantum mechanics. So the first novel way of doing quantum mechanics we just uh, finished discussing was the path integral. So the second novel way of doing quantum mechanics is something called second quantization. So that means we are going to study the uh, creation and annihilation of particles. So rather than think of uh, you know particle number as being fixed. So usually you know if you have a bunch of particles, uh, usually those in quantum mechanics we just ask ourselves what is the probability amplitude for the uh, some particle being at x1 at time t1 and so on and so forth. We don't uh, kind of we are not prepared to handle situations where those particles suddenly disappear from your system altogether. So in fact you might be wondering why would that be a situation to be concerned about in what practical scenarios do you see such things happening. There are many examples where you uh, find such things happening and the most prominent example of course the simplest example is when you are discussing uh, see, see radiation quantum mechanically that means electromagnetic radiation. So if you study electromagnetic waves quantum mechanically you end up uh, having to invoke uh, something called photons. So photons are quanta of light but then quanta of light are just pure energy that they're, they're just energy in the form of discrete packets and energy can spontaneously disappear or uh, appear. And these quanta of uh, energy basically have the mathematical, uh, they, they obey bosonic uh, properties. That means they mathematically manifest themselves as bosons. So in other words, you will have to uh, face the fact that you have these collection of bosons uh, that uh, do not conserve the number. That means that some of them can disappear because they are quanta of energy. They can something, some other particle like say an electron can absorb these quanta and get excited and you have fewer bosons in your system than you started off with. So you have to be able to deal with that. So you should be able to deal with systems with varying number of quantum particles. So, so you can also have a situation where you have varying number of fermions as well. So in fact in the modern way of doing uh, quantum mechanics or quantum field theory is that we think of uh, matter particles uh, not as pre-existing but as being excitations of an underlying matter field. So just like uh, photons are excitations of an underlying quantum version of the electromagnetic field. So there is an electromagnetic field and if you disturb that you propagate electromagnetic waves so that's that would be a classical description but then if you have a quantum version of the electromagnetic field if you excite such a quantum version of the electromagnetic field what pops out are these quanta of radiation which are basically called photons so photons uh, are the quanta of radiation that obey, they behave like bosons. So similarly in a very analogous way we think of the electrons as the quanta of a pre-existing fermion field, so or a matter field. So there is a matter field whose excitations are quanta. So, so that is the modern way of looking at matter and forces. So they are all being treated on the same footing. So matter and forces are on the same footing. So everything is an excitation of an underlying quantum field.
whether it's a matter field or a radiation field or a gluon field or you know some other field quark field so so quarks are excitations of a quark field gluons are excitation of some gluon field all these are quantum mechanical fields whose excitations manifest themselves as particles so uh, so that's the reason why we'll have to uh, come to terms with this uh, point of view and learn how to study quantum mechanics of systems with varying number of particles. So, we should be able to create and annihilate uh, quantum particles. And what we are going to do in the next lecture is we are going to learn how to introduce operators that correspond to creation and annihilation of quantum particles. Okay, I am going to stop here now and uh, I hope you will join me for the next lecture which is all about that. Okay, thank you. I am stopping here. Thank you.